University of Rome. Uh, but Alan must want to say also of Harlan County, because um, he has worked so long in Harlan County and really established his credentials in oral history. You're listening to all those stories, right? right. And you, yes, you were taught oral history in Harlan County. Well, in Harlan County and Terni, yeah. in and a couple of places. Okay. You know, the world has two centers. One is Terni and the other is Harlan. <laughs> And there's no way to introduce Sunder um, because you know so much of our understanding of world history um, comes from really not only reading his work but understanding what interviewing means through the genres in which he writes about his work and his interviews. And so therefore he's made teaching world history very easy. Um, he's made setting up a master's program in world history very easy. Uh, because his work is so multidimensional and um, so important in so many different levels. Um, but I think in terms of the themes of this institute, understanding how meaning changes in place over time is one of his very great contributions. The order has been carried, carried out. Um, his great book on the history of Rome. Um, also, his forthcoming book, which the title is? They say in Harlan County. I, sh I knew that. They say in Harlan County. Um, the years of field work that he's done in Harlan County. Um, really working with people um, as their own identities have changed over time. And as the economic and ecological identities have shifted over time. So I don't know how else to introduce you. Uh. One of the creators of the Summer <laughs> Institute. One of the creatures. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this so, place has made me much more than I've made it. You know? Well, so, thank you again for joining us. Well, <laughs> you know very well that all you have to do is beckon and I, <laughs> and I run. So, anyway, I, well, thank you, and it's so good to meet you all. And uh, I haven't really prepared a presentation, because whenever I start thinking about these things, uh, there are so many ways that they have um, you know, really shaped my life and uh, my thinking and my experience that I don't really know how to start. So I'll play it by ear. And then fortunately, we have time for uh, questions, discussions, contributions, criticism. And um, the first thought, uh, thing that occurred to me when uh, thinking about how do I talk about the Harlan County project in, um, in an institute which is about space. And um, I had three or four random thoughts. The first random thought is, uh, my research on, in Harlan has usually piggybacked on the fact that I was coming here uh, because I could never persuade my department, the English department in the University of Rome, that there are county seats in the United States which you cannot reach by public transportation. <laughs> I mean, there is no way you can go to Harlem on a bus, on a train, on an airplane, no way. In fact, I recently found out that there, is no, that there is really no way other than an airplane to go from Lexington to Louisville in Kentucky. So uh, one of the things that, um, um, I don't know what to make of this, but uh, clearly the, uh, it does go back on the one hand to the mythology, part mythology about Appalachia as an isolated place a place beyond the mountains, self-enclosed valleys, and things like that, which it never really was 100% isolated, uh, because there are books of, uh, uh, that show how uh, Appalachia was part of the world commodities market ever since the 18th century, and so on and so forth. However, uh, uh, the fact that it's still hard to reach uh, suggests that um, it's a different type of place from, say, you know, Chicago or Louisville or, um, or New York. And in fact, after a few years uh, in which I'd been uh, 
doing this work in, uh, in Harlan County. Uh, and everybody had been absolutely friendly and helpful. And, um, and the image and the stereotype there is that, well, when I, my a close friend from Los Angeles, when I was a, an exchange student there, and I emailed, no, that was before email, I wrote her, you know, there was a world before email. So I sent her a letter and said, I'm going to, to do this project in Harlan County. Actually, I said, I'm going to Lexington, Kentucky. And she wrote back and she said, they, uh, oh, it's dangerous, they kill sociologists there. And I wrote back, I'm not a sociologist. Uh, but basically what had happened is that this um, Canadian documentary, um, Hugo Connor, I think his name was, was actually killed for taking some photographs without asking the owner's permission. And, uh, and there was a rebellion all over you know, in public opinion about all these foreigners coming over and uh, uh, stereotyping the place. Um, Appalachia has been, I'm quoting from memory from Don West, who was a <coughs> political organizer in the 30s and a Baptist preacher and a poet, has been missionarized and dog patched and uh, romanticized and al capped to death. And so after a while, I asked my, uh, one of my interviewees. Uh, she's, her name is Mildred Shackleford, and she's, uh, she used to work in the mines, uh, and she's also a poet. And I asked her, why is everybody being so nice to me? And, and that was one of the great lessons in oral history, so I'll read you her answer. Because it has to do with place. Uh, I usually, it, it's an answer in two parts. I usually concentrate on the second part, but uh, it's really the first part that I'm interested in. Where is it? And it says, well, I'll tell you something else uh, that, that makes a lot of difference. You are not from the United States. You are not from New York. When you are not from Chicago, or you are not from Louisville, and you are not from Lexington or, or Knoxville. So I say, you mean, I'm, I'm not from where power comes from? And she says, yes. And then she says, now if you were from Wales, and you were a coal miner, and you come to Harlan County, and you was talking to these people about coal mining, they wouldn't resent you. But you're not trying to influence people or anything. All you're doing is trying to gather a little knowledge or get people to tell you stories and they don't present it. Now, uh, what she's talking about is, on the one hand, the relationship of uh, power, cultural, uh, of, you know, the cultural capital which is at stake in the interview. And, uh, and what she's talking about is, of course, uh, what I, you know, the great lesson is the interviewee always knows more than you do, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be doing the interview, uh, at least about the subject of the interview. And um, so, th and that what I had to offer there was really my two things, my ignorance and my willingness to listen and to learn. And I only later realized that when I talked to people I called and everything, um, what just came natural to me was to say, I'm here to learn about the history and the culture of this place, and I wonder if you would talk to me, basically. And I had never really given much thought to the fact that I was using the word learn rather than the word study, which was featured in the first racist Appalachian joke that I ever heard, and which I will not repeat unless asked. And um, so the idea was, you know, uh, that these people had really felt like a butterfly with a pin in it, uh, which is a metaphor I'm going to use very often from now on, <laughs> and um, <laughs> if I can borrow it. Uh, you know, these people really felt, have felt throughout history like butterflies with a pin in it. And, um, and the relationship of power came uh, to a great extent 
in terms of relationship of space, uh, a relationship between uh, the uh, uh, well, the metropolis and the colonies, because the most powerful tool for sociological interpretation of uh, Appalachian history and economics and society has been the so-called internal periphery theory, which was that uh, basic internal colonialism and internal periphery, that basically Appalachia was a place that was being used as a colony uh, to extract raw materials, uh, coal of course, but not just coal, uh, wood, uh, lum uh, uh, lumber, before, even before coal, uh, natural gas, and as one teacher in the local community college pointed out to me, people. Uh, he talked about the brain drain, the intelligent young people from Harlan County that migrate. So he said, we're exporting all our resources. And uh, until quite recently, uh, well, and to a large extent today, uh, there were fortunes, huge fortunes being made in Appalachia. But uh, taxes weren't being paid there. You know, the coal companies would take their profits elsewhere, and they may be taxed in uh, Chicago or Louisville or Lexington or New York, and the community is, found, is left with uh, a very low tax base, uh, totally uh, damaged environment and people, and of course, very poor services, very poor uh, schools, because they're based on the local tax base. So this uh, relationship, uh, this particular place with, um, with the metropolis, with, with the rest of the nation, uh, interested me, partly because, um, for all of these reasons, and in fact, uh, but also because there's an article by Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco is you know, just, well, he's written The Name of the Rose, but he's important for other reasons. <laughs> he's, he's a major semiologist and everything. And he had an article about Italy as the periphery of the empire. So, um, in fact, the first paper I, I wrote about this was called Two Peripheries Talk to Each Other and How they relate to each other, and how some models that have been developed uh, to explain, but basically to stigmatize Southern Italian culture, like the model, uh, the so-called um, amoral familism, that was the way that the American sociologist Banfield explained uh, Lucania in Southern Italy. Uh, I found that you know it's the typical blame the victim. You know they're poor because there's something wrong in their culture uh, that makes them poor. And I found that this model was being applied also to Appalachia because of course one of the things is these people both cultures care very much about family for one thing, and um, and both cultures have a very very complicated relationship to the state, and in both cultures you have. The, these local elites that act as brokers between the state and the people and generate all sorts of corruption, nepotism, and so on. So that was one, one of the thoughts that I had about Appalachian space. Uh, the, these are all random. So the other thought was, the um, reason I got interested in Appalachia was that in uh, 1968, where so many things began, uh, I was staying uh, with um, Barbara Dane in Brooklyn. Barbara Dane, in the 50s, was described by, Eb she's, white, she's a blue-eyed blonde lady from Detroit. Uh, her grandmother was from Harlan, it turns out. Um, she was described by Ebony as the greatest blues singer after Billie Holiday. <laughs> And she gave it up to sing protest songs in the 60s. So I was staying at her house, and uh, she made a tape for me. And one of the songs she sang was a song from Harlan County by Sarah Ogan Gunning. And the song was, I Hate the Capitalist System. 
And I thought, I don't realize that people might, in this country, have ever uttered such words. Where did, where did she come from? And, and she says, Harlan. And I realized that I, I was beginning to, the reason I'm here, I started out being interested in American folk songs. And the reason I was interested in American folk song was that I was interested in the, in the B-sides of the Elvis records in the 50s, which means the country sides and everything. Uh, so, and I realized I had a record uh, that I, I hadn't paid much attention to uh, with a song that said, they say in Harlan County there are no neutrals there, which side are you on, which side are you on? So I said there must be something to this place and I started finding out and uh, um, I was able to, I was invited by somebody to just take a ride through there in the early 70s. Uh, there was a big strike going, uh, going on. Uh, the stri I don't know if you've seen the, the film, it's an Oscar, um, it's an Academy Award winning documentary, Harlan County, USA by Barbara Koppel. And it's about a strike in 73, 74. Right? And the friend that was driving me around uh, showed me, took me around, and it, we went and talked to people that were involved in the strike. And I didn't understand a word. Somebody talked about accents. And, uh, well, their accent is different from mine. And, um, but it was fascinating. And, uh, and I, I thought I would like to go back. I thought I would like to go back. And when I went back, uh, I went back uh, basically, after I had begun my other major oral history project, um, which was this project in Terni. Terni is a steel town. Interestingly, it's a steel town within a valley in uh, Umbria, which is the center of Italy. It's 60 miles north of Rome. Which I was born in Rome, but I grew up there. And it's... Um, and uh, and the reason I did this project in Terni was that I had started doing, uh, you know, collecting folk songs, industrial folk songs, folk songs about the resistance about, uh, in, uh, in Terni. And after a while, I realized that people didn't just sing the songs, they also told stories about them. And the stories were very interesting. And um, so I sort of started getting interested in the stories in oral history. But what had drawn me to Terni was the fact that just as in Harlan, you had traditional musical forms, like very archaic, uh, <coughs> polyphonic singing about you know, harvest or things like that, that were being reused to sing about strikes, to sing about the unions. And uh, this was exactly what was happening in Harlem, where Sarah Ogan could take uh, a song, uh, Precious Memories, and sing Dreadful Memories, or where Florence Rees could take a song, Lay the Lilies Low, which is a gospel song, which is based on an old ballad tune, Jack Monroe, and write, Which Side Are You On? And my interpretation of this was, both places are industrial places. However, in both places, industry was not developed gradually uh, over time by local forces. In both places, industry was dropped wholesale from outside, and, uh, which means that the uh, shift from the rural to the industrial culture was very quick. It was very traumatic, but also people didn't have time to forget their uh, rural heritage. So they still had the songs uh, that they could, s and they still had the uh, power of, of song. The, they could still sing. They could still, um, they still valued self-expression. Uh, and they used it for, uh, to express, you know, the changes. And so that there you had, uh, a process of modernization where uh, modernity was being reinterpreted and redefined in the terms of a still thriving traditional culture. And you had all these incredible songs, this, this incredible 
tradition of uh, music that, of course, flourished in the 30s because that's when uh, urban intellectuals like Theodor Dreiser on one end and Pete Seeger on the other connected to Harlem, but it still goes on. It still goes on, and if you go to Harlem now, uh, every house has a musical instrument. Of course, every church has hundreds of great singers and musicians, and uh, songs are still being made by local people about strip mining, about mountaintop removal, about the environment, and things like that. So that was the other thing. You know, this, uh, this place where uh, modernity was dropped wholesale and uh, the traditional culture was not forgotten, but it was used as um, a way to express the experience of modernization. Uh, if you've seen, uh, like, if you have seen the Barbara Koppel movie, Harlan County, USA, uh, maybe the most moving moment is when uh, there's a funeral of people killed in the mines and then uh, Phyllis Boyens and Nimrod Workman, they're not from Harlem, they're from Tennessee. Uh, he's, a, he's a former coal miner. They sang, Oh Death, which is this extraordinary, you know, chilling spiritual about death, spare me over for another year. And, um, and clearly they're using this old spiritual, uh, which, Alan Lomax connect, collected from Vera Hall, black woman in Alabama, you know, uh, but it's you know used in both black and white tradition to talk about death in the coal mines, and uh, not just you know natural death. And that was another thing. And the third thought was um, Harlan County, USA. What does it mean? You know, the question was, uh, because somehow the, the title of the film uh, suggests that there's a relationship between Harlem and the USA. But it doesn't tell, doesn't tell us what. And of course, um, is Harlem typical of the United States? Is all the United States like that? Of course not. Uh, is it an oxymoron? Which is, uh, sometimes you find in this country where something wrong happens and they say, this is not the USA. I can think of a song by, can't remember who, but uh, it's a song about uh, a lynching in the South Monroe, North Carolina, I think. And the song says, Monroe is Monroe part of the United States? Or Phil Ox about, again, uh, the, uh, the racist incidents in the South. And he says, Mississippi, find yourself another country to be, to be, from, to be, uh, to, to be part of. And of course, listening to that song, I said, what other country? What else? You know, maybe South Africa, but you know, um, where else? So is that an exception? Or is it uh, the kind of exception that, um, the kind of pathology, quote, 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 unquote, pathology that tells you a lot about the physiology? And because where else but Harlan County do we find that kind of uh, historical experience? Uh, not that we don't find exploitation, of course, v class violence, you know, struggle all over, but the forms that it takes are specific. To the, to the United States. The Harlan County, on the one hand, it's the South, but 
to me, it's more like the frontier. To me, uh, part of the tradition of the isolation has been, uh, well, a sort of weakness of the law. In a way, it's not very much different from Sicily today, you know, you know, where the state and the law have been absent, weak, or oppressive. And uh, somehow, uh, conflict has taken forms that are derived from this kind of experience. And also, where, you know, the the type of class relationships are so different. Tell you a little story. Uh, my first research visit, you know, I went there in in '73, and then I, I have to remember to tell you a little story about '73. But uh, I went back in '86. And I went to Lynch. Now, Lynch, now you go over Black Mountain, which is the tallest mountain in Kentucky, and there's a sign, Welcome to Kentucky. And it's got a horse. Because, of course, Kentucky is the bluegrass, it's, uh, and the horse is riddled with bullets. Yeah. You know? So, Welcome to Kentucky, and what do you expect? Then you go to Lynch, and Lynch is a model uh, uh, coal town. Um, it's really lovely. It's uh, it's very decent. It's very well kept, um, and um, and everything. It was, however, a number of people that you talked to said, "Well, this place used to be like a concentration camp," because that's that's one of the metaphors that are often used about you know the coal camps. Uh, you could you couldn't get go, get out. You couldn't come in. It was uh, fenced in, and um, so I started talking to people and doing interviews, and I was talking to this man, uh, an old black miner who wore a baseball cap that said, God, guts, and guns made the UMWA. And, um, and he told me horror stories about what you know, had been happening. So I said, do you mind if we do an interview? He said, of course, yes. So I went over like a block from where I was staying at this friend's house, got my tape recorder, went back, turned the tape recorder on and said, well, uh, you were telling me what this place was. Well, it was pretty nice, they were treating us well. And, uh, uh, and uh, that was a great lesson. Because of course I realized that when I was doing the same kind of interviews in Terni with Italian steel workers, uh, they would tell you, the stories they would say on tape would be much more negative than the stories they would say in the conversation uh, because, uh, because Italy is Italy and this is the United States. And um, because where is the source of dignity, identity, and pride in working class people? In the case of Italy, it used to come, now we're, we're uh, I'm still talking like a 50s, 60s, 70s person. I don't know about 90s and 200, 2000s. But we used, it used to come from uh, the fact that they had tried to exploit you. They had done terrible things to you, but you fought back. But you fought back. And you fought back with the union. You fought back with the party, which no longer exists. Uh, and. Um, so that in order to enhance the image of pride and dignity that you're projecting, uh, you make conditions much starker than they really were. For instance, you forget to mention that, yes, you were working in the factory, you were being exploited, and so on and so forth, but your wife had a little store on the side that, on the, on the other hand, the reason why you could go on strike is that your wife had a little store on the side. But you wouldn't mention this, or because, of course, uh, that's, that's where your dignity came from. In Harlan, uh, and I think this has to do with 
two influences in Italy, one of which is disappearing uh, and it's Marxism, and the other is, is turning sour and it's Catholicism. But both put a prize in you know, the poor, the exploited, the victims are always either revolutionary or virtuous or both. So, uh, here, I mean, here, uh, I keep trying, you know, I, I should mention that what I get paid for is to teach American literature. <laughs> yes. And uh, I keep trying to explain to my students how Puritanism works. And I have a lot of admiration being a non-believer. I can afford to have a lot of uh, respect and admiration for the Puritans. Um, and, uh, and the great difference there is, in a way, that uh, if success is a sign of grace, I'm, I'm making this much simpler than it is, then, uh, then the victim then the poor, well, they have something wrong with them. So that uh, your um, pride comes from not having been, from not being poor, from not having been exploited, from not being a victim. Uh, and because uh, you don't have this category, well, because this, the category of class is not a category that is often used. Uh, the, uh, this becomes very much a, a matter of individual dignity. I have this great interview with this lady that says, uh, and I asked her, uh, well, what was it like to live in the coal camp? Oh, real nice. Uh, and then she goes on and uh, you, know, you breathe the coal dust from morning to night and you're, you never knew if your husband came home at night, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But the Lord has helped us. We had a pretty good life. And maybe they did. I mean, you know, but uh, in order to say this, and that they may have had a pretty good life because of family, because, uh, because of so many other things, because of the beauty of nature around them. But basically, you know, you know the key passage in that interview was, uh, of course, you know, they, uh, the company had all the power and everything, but if you were a good worker, you didn't have any trouble. And uh, which means that your dignity came from, on the one hand, doing your, doing your job, which you also find a lot in the old time communist workers in Italy. Uh, but it also came from being recognized as doing your job well. Which, of course, reminds me of the wonderful passage in the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, where he talks about how, first of all, you've got to be a good worker. Number two, you must be, uh, if you're working, uh, when you work, do work as close to the public highway as possible so that people can see that you're a good worker. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and it feeds into industrial relationships as well, meaning that well, we, until maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the model for the unions in Italy was conflict. And here, the model for the union has always been union recognition. The union exists the, the, if the employer recognizes it. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, inevitable relationship between, uh, the inevitable coexistence, non-conflictual coexistence, like in the case of the mining industry, uh, the uh, one thing that really shocked me <laughs> was when I found out that the miners' uh, pension, health, and retirement fund, which number one, uh, I come from a 
from a country in which not many things work well and our public health system doesn't work well, but we have a public health system. And uh, you know, you're, you know, one, a lot of the things that we take as rights, like being able to reach the county seat of public transportation, this is a civil right to us. Uh, healthcare is a civil right. Uh, there's a different definition of rights here. So first of all, I really, uh, you know, I was, I found out that uh, uh, healthcare was a privilege, and you had it because where you, you you were a coal miner and a member of the union, but the way and it was administered by the union, not by the state, but the way it was funded was by a royalty on each ton of coal extracted, which means that the union has a stake in the production of coal, and that and that a strike uh, harms the union's uh, chest as much as it does the, the company. So that the strike becomes very much, a, uh, at this point, uh, throughout the 60s and 70s, <coughs> strikes were like dancing. Both sides went through the steps, but, uh, but basically they had a basic shared interest. And this model is growing in Italy now, uh, but but you know the key uh, political experience to us in terms of unions was the late sixties, early seventies, where the idea was no conflict, not uh, mutual recognition. So these are the few random thoughts that came to me as I was thinking, you know, in terms of space. The little story about 1973. 1973, my friend David Walsh, I was, I was too shy to turn the tape recorder on whenever we went to see these people. And, but at one point, we finally went to visit this magnificent woman, uh, Granny Hager, Francis Hager, granny means um, you know, the women that helped in, you know, that have been childbirth. And uh, Granny Hager had been in everything okay, uh, since the 30s. She'd been in the Battle of Everett, which was the great battle, of, uh, the great Union battle. She'd been in all the strikes and everything. And um, I didn't, I could understand about maybe 15% of what she said, but finally I got my courage up and I said, can I, do you mind if I turn the tape recorder on? She didn't. And she was talking about the roving pickets, which was this mass rank and file rebellion in the mid 60s, in which miners re rebelled against the union that had, that was taking away their health cards but fought back by blowing up coal mines and tipples and things like that. She was, she was in it too, she was one of the leaders. And then she said, and I've got scars all over my body that I can show you, I've got in Harlan, and on my legs and on my arms where the scabs would try to back us off the picket line. And that here place, I don't guess you can see it too good, the white place, that they prick the skin up like that and one man held it and held my hand and had them cut that whole chunk out of my hand. And this right here, the doctors once, they were afraid it's cancer, but that is where they held a cigar to my hand till it burned out most through here. And my friend David Walls has, uh, was in Harlem, because the interview was in Perry County, uh, just across. And she said, yeah, in the early 30s. And I've got scars all over my legs. You can't see them too good. Right there is a sunken place and there's a scar. And I got scars on my body where they'd, they'd take knife points, you know, sharp knife points, and just barely stick it through the skin where it hurt and twist it. Uh, uh, she says, twist it. That way it makes a small hole. Now that's what we went through without trying to organize, trying to get something out of, for the people. So you talk of space. And it's, 
as if this woman's body was a space in which the whole history of the struggle in Appalachia has been etched. You know? and, uh, um, and I remember uh, driving th through uh, Letcher County, Perry County, Harlan County, uh, North County, uh, where, uh, where strip mining has left uh, it has left its marks you know, on the on on the hills on the earth, uh, and uh, thinking, all right, this whole all these mountains are like Granny Hager's body; they have scars on them, and uh, and in fact, this metaphor of the scars is a metaphor that uh, a number of people in the environmental anti-strip mining movement use, that, and I found that they do. They also use other metaphors like uh, homemade Vietnam, like a moonscape, but the scars, the scars because, again, that's the other thought I had about place, uh, because there is uh, the kind of relationship that people have with place there uh, is very deep. It's very deep. On the, on the one hand, uh, it's a little bit like ours. I mean, you can be four generations away, but you're still from Sicily. And although I'm three generations away and I don't think of myself as being from Sicily, but you know, that's another story. Um, but, uh, they're like us uh, in the sense that geographic mobility, migration, like, you know, Sicilians migrate to Germany, uh, the Calabrese migrate to Belgium, uh, and even those who migrated to the United States, they always did with the thought of going back, of going home. Uh, in until, until they were allowed to vote where they live, uh, Italian workers uh, came back from Germany, Belgium, France, to Italy to vote every year. So uh, as opposed to the dominant image of geographic mobility in the United States where people are supposed to be moving uh, easily and um, uh, Appalachians are like Italians in the sense that down home or maybe some you know down uh, some of this, maybe this is this is very much part being part of the south though uh, I can I'm thinking of a number of stories from African American literature where they people live in Chicago but down home is in Carolina and Appalachians uh, in the first years of migration in the, in the mid 50s I have uh, uh, this uh, union organizer for Chicago Ed Sadlowski who was uh, uh, a leader in the opposition to the United Steelworkers Union uh, told me, he said, he was living in Chicago near the highway and he said every Friday you could see the lines of cars heading south and every Sunday night you could see the lines of cars driving back. You know, people would go home every weekend, every weekend. I can also think of how this changed. Um, this man uh, he talks about how he says his brothers went to Chicago and they would come back, pat you on the head, give you a dollar. And then a year later, they came back and they, they, they left with uh, uh, plastic bags. And, the, the, and a year later, they came back and they had suitcases. They pat you on the head and they give you 50 cents. And then a year later, they came back, they didn't pat you on the head. They, 
were ashamed to eat with you because they thought you were nasty people and they didn't give you a cent and a year later they never came back. So uh, there is such a thing as you know, not relating to home anymore. But the idea that you start out and you want to go back and this is still home is, um, is, is very powerful, it's very powerful. And um, and I I've done a lot of in, a number of interviews in Michigan in Ohio with migrants and uh, and they all you know had the sense that that's home they may have been living in Ypsilanti Michigan for twenty years but uh, it's home okay. Uh, and then, um, and this very deep relationship uh, to the to the to the place is unlike ours, because uh, the, there is a strong attachment to the place, to the physical quality of the place. Uh, There's a, there's, there, there are scars on the hills near Terni as well. Um, but people don't seem to mind. People don't seem to mind. Uh, yeah, it's ugly, but uh, we need it for, to, because we need to keep this concrete factory going and its jobs and, uh, the, and the sense of place is more like language we speak, uh, or the people that we know, or in the case of Terni, it's interesting because the reason they love being in Terni, young people, is that it's so easy to get away from, and, uh, and all the interesting places are within reach, but it's not a center for anything. In uh, in Kentucky, in Appalachia, in Harlan. You know the trees, the water, the mountains are very much a part of the of, your, of the sense of place. And um, there's this lady, Hazel King. She's passed away now. Uh, in her 70s, she started literally climbing up the hills uh, to find and denounce environmental damage from strip mining. She actually, uh, she was the first person in the United States that managed to get a strip mine site closed. You know? uh, and, and she said, you know, people tell me, don't you feel kind of suffocated by these mountains? You know, one thing about Appalachia is the mountains are very close together, very steep, and the valleys are very, very low, uh, very, very, very narrow. Sometimes you have room for the creek, the highway, or the street, the road, and sometimes the railroad, and that's all. And one big difference is, where do we build our towns? We build them on top of the hills for defense purposes from way back when each little town was a different state at war with the next little town. Uh, in Appalachia, they build towns in the few flat sp spaces they, that they can find. You know. But, and she said, you know, so this is, this can, you know, there's a song that's called You'll Never Get Out of Harlan Alive. And it says, in Harlan, the sun comes up at three o'clock in the afternoon and it goes away at six because, of course, the valley is so narrow. And she says, no, I don't feel suffocated or anything. I feel that this is like, I feel embraced. I feel that this is like being in the womb. I feel that it, it keeps me warm, she said. So that the damage to the place, the destruction of the, uh, of the land is very much like the the wounds on Granny Hager's body. I mean, uh, I don't think they have, they use this metaphor 
that's very popular in the environmental movements, at least in Europe, as the planet as a living creature, Gaia. Gaia. Uh, but to all practical purposes, the mountains are living uh, um, Earth, and also they're full of living beings, you know, the birds, and they kill, and the creeks, and the fish in the creeks, and the wildlife, you know, and even the snakes, they're part of daily life, you know, so that the destruction of the land means also the destruction of the wildlife, uh, which is something that they've made a living out of, but also something that they relate uh, as uh, well as something that they love, basically, a lot of the people that I talk to. So you have this relationship, and then um, you know, I'm not a religious person, uh, but in Harlem I go to church because my friends go to church, because the music is great, and because the preaching is great, and because I expect them to start handling snakes any moment, but so far. Uh, but I've only seen, the, seen them carry the snake in the box, but the Lord hasn't moved them yet. Uh, and um, so they always ask me to testify. And how do you testify if you're a total non-believer in a holiness church? So, <laughs> uh, especially if they know that you're from Rome, and Rome is the Antichrist. And <laughs> um, so, my line usually is, well, I remember once the most successful testimony, which was, I flew over here, and from the plane, I could see the scars on the mountains. And I think it's a sin. Now, the word sin means something different from me than it does from them. But basically, you know, they could relate to that very much. Uh, you know, uh, holiness, religion, and uh, the care of the earth somehow clicked. You know, this idea that you're on, uh, on earth to take care. There's a song that uh, Jean Ritchie sings. Jean Ritchie, she's a folk singer. She's from... Perry County, just across, the, just across the valley from Harlem. And she sings a song where the Lord says, uh, you can live in my garden, but please take care of my sheep. And so there's a sense of being caretakers of the trees of the land. And also the sense that the destruction of the land is a very concrete physical threat to them. The, the people in this particular church live in a hollow that had been swept by uh, 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 flash flood, and uh, so they know very well. And uh, in fact, Annie Napier, who was my was my closest collaborator, she she remem she told talked about going to a meeting after the flood, and people talked about how the flood had been an act of God, just like the oil spill, and. Um, and she says, of course, the rain was an act of God, but it wasn't God that put them bulldozers on top of them hills. And uh, so they can tell very well, uh, you know, what God wants us to do and what humans are doing to the, to the land. So that at this time, the, uh, uh, the important thing in Harlan has to do again with space. In that... Uh, you know, you go to Harlem because of all the great stories about the unions. There's a whole generation that, does, that has no experience of the unions because they have no experience of the coal mines. Uh, what, it, what coal mining is there is these little one-horse truck mines, totally non-union. Um, but they have the experience of the, strip, of the stripping and the experience of the mountaintop removal. I don't know if you know, if you all, all of you know what mountaintop removal is. You know, you take off the top of a mountain to get at the coal, and then you throw what they, what you call the overburden 
onto the valley. And you claim that you created flat land so that people can build factories on it, which never happens. Uh, and I feel, and this is something that I would not feel if I hadn't been educated there, that the, the calling the earth burden is blasphemy. <laughs> You know, the earth is not a burden. The earth is the earth. I'm not especially an environmentalist, but you know, Harlan does this kind of things to you, to your mind. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because there's no opposition anymore, uh, the uh, the practice of mountain top removal has been dominant. And one of the ways in which uh, mountaintop removal is um, unchallengeable is that they claim it's good for, uh, to help make the United States independent of you know, foreign oil to produce energy. And so the talk, the um, the University of Kentucky is being largely subsidized by the coal industry that subsidizes research on turning coal into fuel uh, or things like that, you know, uh, synth fuel, so that, uh, so that people can still drive big automobiles on cheap, on homemade fuel out of coal that comes out of totally destroying one section of of the country. And um, so what organizing there is in Appalachia now has to do with the struggle against uh, mountaintop removal and strip mining. But if you look at the editorial page of the New York Times today, it has an editorial about the mining disaster in West Virginia a couple of months ago. 27 people killed, and uh, and it says that Senator Rockefeller is trying to help these people, these miners being heard, and they're finally, for the first time, talking about the real issues of mine safety, which, you know, if you were from Wales and were talking about mine safety, they would listen to you. And uh, one thing is, Barack Obama, when he was a senator, he came from a coal-producing state, and he supported legislation in, cha in favor of turning coal into fuel. So uh, there has to be some kind of pressure to make him see. And he, he's smart enough and generous enough that he will, may be able to see this. But. Um, that a lot of the legislation that has been passed over the, 30 year, over the last 30 years uh, about coal mining is, has huge loopholes at best. And uh, it has the interest of the mining industry at heart a lot more than the, the interest of the people and the land. And the union has been supporting it because uh, because even five jobs out of uh, on a strip mine on a mountaintop removal site are five jobs, and because the union has, for the last 60 years, identified its the interest of the workers, the interest of the union, with the interest of the industry, a lot more than with than it does with the industry of the of the working people there. I think I will. Stop here, and so we have time for. Talk. I I had prepared a totally different kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh,